Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have to come around your holy word. We believe it is your word, not inspired by man at any account, but inspired by you. And so we bring our lives humbly before it today and asking you, Father, to speak to us. Because each of us come today with our own needs, our own hurts, our own passions and desires that we need to hear from you to guide our lives. And we ask all this in the name of Christ, amen and amen. As you're opening your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, that's where we are in our reading uh, this past week. As you open your Bibles there, you'll discover that in 1 Peter, that Peter is writing to some hurting people. He's writing to a church that is facing persecution because of their faith in Christ Jesus. And as Peter is writing, he understands that so well. But what Peter wants them to understand are a couple of things. The first one he wanted them to understand as they are facing persecution, he wanted them to understand, keep doing the right thing. Don't allow the persecution to cause you to become ungodly in your approach to life or to others. You keep doing the right thing even under the trials that you're in. The second thing he wanted to remind him is this, is that Christ suffered. Do you think that you ought to be able to do something that Christ didn't have to go through? If Christ suffered, it only makes sense that you too are going to have to suffer if you carry the name of Christ. But then he wanted to understand this, that Christ won the victory. And his victory becomes your victory. Christ's victory becomes your victory that you can claim in your own life as you are facing the suffering that you're going through. You see throughout the letter that we're going to see is that this church was suffering greatly. But I believe that there are some of you that are coming today that you are suffering as well today. Maybe it's an emotional loss that you're facing. Maybe it's financial difficulties. Maybe it's some illness that you're facing in your life, but you come just like the people came that read this letter, that you come as someone that is suffering today. I want you to see in 1 Peter, look in verse 6 just for a moment, the last part. It says that you have been distressed by various trials, verse 7, even though they were tested by fire, chapter 2, verse 12 that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those that are, listen, unreasonable, verse 19. For this finds favor, for the sake of conscience towards God and man, bear under the sorrow when suffering unjustly. Chapter 4, verse 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ. Chapter 4, verse 18, but if anyone suffers as a Christian. Chapter 4, verse 19, therefore those who also suffer according to the will of God. You grasp the idea when you casually look through this book that there are some suffering and hurting people that he is writing to. But I want to say a word to you that are here this morning that are are suffering and hurting, that God has a word for your life today, that God really cares. And he cares where you are in your hurt and your pain. And God wants to speak to you. So look at our text today in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 18, all the way through verse 22. Notice what it says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. I hope 21 caught your attention, and I hope uh, verse 19 caught your attention as well. 
we're going to have, those are difficult passages. We're going to have some of our deacons come up and help us out with that. I'll call them out uh, unaware to them to come out and help us on those. Corresponding to the baptism now saves you. Not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection, notice, of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into the heavens after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. We find, first of all, that as he's writing to these hurting people, he wanted them to understand one thing, and one thing that he wanted to drive to them is that Christ was victorious. Even though he suffered in his life, and even though he had all this pain that he faced in his life, listen, on the other end, Christ was victorious. And he's saying to you today, even though you're suffering now for a while, even though you have great sorrow that you are carrying in your life, even though you've got these burdens that that seem overwhelming to your life, understand this, you too will be victorious one day. He begins this way by saying Christ is victorious over sin. Notice how he begins in verse 18. He says, for Christ, for Christ. He wanted to lift their vision simply off their suffering. He wanted them to remember that Christ, to put your focus upon Christ and understand what he had to go through as well. You see, it's not just about you, he's trying to say to the church of that time. It's also that you've got to remember our calling and our purpose. You can't get away that Christ as well suffered. We find it in 1 Peter 2, verse 21. It says, for you have been called for this very purpose since Christ also suffered. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 says, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ. And we see that in our text in Chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also died for sins. Christ suffered greatly. But we should never forget why Christ suffered. He suffered because of you. It was on your account that he suffered. Because on that cross, he took your sins upon himself, and there he suffered for sin in order that you could be set free and be victorious over the sin that would hold you and bind you in its control, but it would also send you to hell. He won the victory. 1 Peter 2, said he committed no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 said he made him to be sin. 1 John 3, 5 says you know that he appeared in order to take away the sins, and in him there is no sin. Christ suffered greatly on the cross. But it says in our text, he suffered once and for all. When a Jewish Christian heard those words, it would stand out to him greatly. Once and for all? It is estimated that during the Passover, there would be as many as 250,000 animals that were slain during the Passover alone. Can you imagine one sacrifice after another sacrifice after another sacrifice? And it was said that the blood was so heavy that it would flow out of the temple and flow down in the Kidron Valley, and it would create a river of blood that would flow. And they read these words that Christ would suffer once. Once. It's an interesting word. Uh, we find it's hapox in the Greek. It, it means a completed act. His blood was sufficient to cleanse you once and for all, and Christ would never have to die again. But I want you to notice in our text some points that we need to see about Christ's death. First of all, that Christ's death is never to be repeated again. It was sufficient enough that when Christ died, his death was sufficient enough to take care of sins for all time. And never would he have to die again. Some of you here today maybe came from the Catholic Church or saved out of the Catholic Church, and now you've come into our church. 
It's an interesting book by a Catholic priest called The Faith of Millions by John O'Brien. And he talks about the sacraments. And he says that when they do the sacraments, they call Christ down again. And they call him down out of heaven again where Christ dies. And I, and I quote what he says. He says, the priest brings Christ down from the heavens and renders him present on the altar and the eternal victim of the sins of man. Not once, but a thousand times he dies. And what the priest is saying is that Christ dies again and again and again and again. But you and I understand that the Word of God says that Christ died once and it was sufficient to take care of your sins forever and ever and ever. But second, he points out that Christ died for the sins of man. You ever wonder why Christ died? What he had to go through the ugly, cruel cross? First Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, he died for the sake of you. Man, I love that verse. He died for the sake of you. You are the reason that he died. He didn't die because of anything that he has done. He didn't die because of his own sins. He died for you. You're the reason that he died. But thirdly, he points out that Christ's death was a vicarious death. The just, did you notice that? Christ, being the just one, died for us, the unjust. The just one died for the unjust. He took our place on the cross. He took our sentence of sin that separated us from God. And he died for us. And he, he placed himself on the cross in order that we wouldn't have to die in our sins and be separated from God for all eternity. I love 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him. It's one of our memory verses, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why did he do all this? Number four, Christ's death brings us to God. You notice the words that he might bring us to God. The word is pros ego. Pros ego, he brought us to God. He's the only way that we can have entrance to God, acceptance by God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. The only way that a man or a woman, a student, can ever have access to God is not by their good deeds, it's not by their church affiliation, not by their goodwill, not by their own righteousness, it's by what Christ did on the cross, and it's Christ that brings sinful man a sinful woman, a sinful student, and brings them to a holy God. We must come through Christ and Christ alone. A missionary was speaking to a tribe in Africa. And as he was speaking to them, they've never heard about Christ. And this missionary had this unbelievable task to explain what what Christ has done and how Christ died. And he began to explain who Jesus was. And the chief was there on the front row, and he was listening so attentive. And he began to explain to them that Christ died on the cross for their sins. And when he got to that point, the chief stood up and said, Stop! He said, Stop! Take him down! I'm the one that needs to be on the cross. And the chief got it right. We're the ones that deserve to be on that cross because it was our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And if we're ever going to have a relationship with God, it can only come through Jesus of what he did. And we find ourselves in that position of that chief sometimes when we humbly look at the cross of what Christ has done and we want to cry out, take him down. But at the same time, we we understand that he had to stay on that cross or we could never be forgiven because Christ was victorious over sin for us in order that we might be set free and have a relationship with you. And so Paul writes to those that are suffering. He writes to them to remind them of this, that Christ was victorious over sin. But also he wanted them to understand that Christ was just not victorious over sin, but he was also victorious over death. 
all through the scriptures that we find that Christ was victorious over death. Notice in verse 18, it says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. There has always been those who have come along and said that Christ never really died on the cross. They've come up with all these theories. So there's the swoon theory. And the swoon, swoon theory goes like this is that Christ was on the cross, yes. But he kind of went into a swoon, or we would use the word unconscious. And when they put him in that uh, cool cave, that cool tomb, it it brought him to, and and Christ just got up and walked away. Well, there's a lot of arguments that we could say against that for sure. Is that the executors that were there, they, they were professional. And they made sure that every victim on the crosses that day were dead. And to ensure that Christ died, they they took a spear and and put it in his side to make sure he was dead. And then what about the grave clothes that were undisturbed? And so we see that that theory doesn't work. And then there is a hallucination theory. They believe the post-resurrection views of Christ, witness to Christ, they People who guess were so grief stricken, they, they hallucinated and they, and they thought they saw Christ, but uh, they really didn't. But what about Thomas who said, My Lord, my God? He saw him and he believed. So we know the hallucination theory is not right as well. And then they came up with the impersonation theory. This, this is really stretching it. Uh, they said somebody else impersonated Christ. It wasn't really Christ who died and rose again. It was somebody that was impersonating him. It really wasn't him. And then there was the spiritual resurrection theory saying that Christ died, his body died, and didn't raise from the grave, but his spirit did. But we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find that he bodily arose. For 500 witnesses saw him alive and give testimony to the fact that, that Christ is alive. And then the thief theory is the belief that somebody stole his body. The unknown tomb theory is that they went to the wrong tomb. But all these are false accounts. When Jesus died, the Bible tells us that he died. And he died in his body. But his body then rose from the dead. And he reigns and rules and he's alive today. That Christ is alive. And he defeated death. In order that you and I, that when we die to this earthly life, that our spirits will live forever until our bodies are resurrected and are united again with our spirits, where we will have a new physical body. And listen, one day each of us in this room, we will die or we'll be caught up together in the rapture. And until that day that our song is victory in Jesus, because Christ won the victory over death, It means for our lives that we too have that joy to be able to say that we have won the victory over death through Christ as well. But there's a third thing I want you to see. Christ is victorious in his proclamation. Look with me, if you would, in verse 19 and 20, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. But once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. What in the world is he talking about? In verse 19, you can write out beside your Bible, there are at least 20 different interpretations of what this verse means. Here's the good news. The good news is it won't send you to hell or heaven if you get it wrong, okay? Okay. And so if you got the wrong interpretation in in your mind and your beliefs, it's not going to affect your eternal state. That's the good news. But of the 20 views, I'm here to tell you the correct view today, okay? And I say that with tongue in cheek. Because there are so many great scholars and so many men have studied this and have different ideas, but this one makes the most sense to me. Notice what it's talking about. It says that, that he went and made proclamation. The word is caruso. Caruso really means to preach. And what 
is saying is that Christ went somewhere to preach a message. And what was the message that Christ proclaimed? Well, we find that we need to understand when it was, where it was, what is this place that he went, this prison. We find in Genesis chapter 6 an interesting story in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It talks about these demons came and cohabitated with women. And they would have produced then a generation of people that were demonized. What, what, what are you talking about? Look in Genesis chapter 6 a little bit later when you get home. In Genesis chapter 6, and so when did this occur? When, when did this occur in history? It occurred in those 120 years when Noah was building the ark of God. We find it was an evil time, a wicked time. And we find that these demons went and inhabited the bodies of men. And you're saying, wow, what, what are you talking about? Stay with me. They inhabited the bodies of men in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, and verse 4, you'll see. And they had children by women, and these women weren't forced, but they agreed to marry these demonized men to have these children, which would mean then you would have a generation of people that could not be redeemed. And they were all killed during the flood. But these demons were so vile, so wicked, that God held them in a special place to be held until the final judgment. Go back with me to verse 19, in which he went and made proclamation to the spirits. I believe he's talking about these demons that are now in prison that are being held. And what was Christ's proclamation to these spirits being held? His proclamation is this, I'm alive. Man, I've won. I have won the victory over death. I'm alive. And to these demonic beings that were held in prison, Christ went there and began to declare, began to preach to them how he's defeated death and that Satan that threw up the best that he could at Christ was defeated there on the cross and in the resurrection. And Jesus makes a proclamation there, and he declares that he's defeated death once and for all, and that he is alive. But we find out there's another victory that Christ says. He's victorious over his foes. Notice falling along in, in verses 19 and 20, we find that he illustrates it with Noah. And in Noah's time, we find that God sent a flood to all those that wouldn't believe. For 120 years, Noah preached, and nobody listened. Nobody responded as, as Noah shared how they needed to be saved, to place their faith in God. Nobody believed for 120 years. You're talking about a discouraging ministry. Only eight followed him, his family. And they were caught up, listen, in the flood, in the water, and they were destroyed. It brings up that interesting verse that you find there in verse 10. The word corresponding could be interpreted this because in the Greek it's called an anatype, the word. And so we would use it this way in English. It's an analogy. See, the waters were never a saving part. The waters were always something that brought judgment. The waters brought judgment upon Christ's foes. He was victorious over his foes because the judgment came and, and destroyed them. The water destroyed them. And so when a person enters into the baptism of water, what they are entering into is a symbolic judgment. They're entering into the judgment. Because when they are buried, they are buried into death. They are buried into the judgment and they come to Christ, and when they are raised out, they are raised to walk in the newness of life. Water was always a sign of judgment. It was never a sign of salvation. But notice how that verse is linked. Notice the end of it. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's always been linked to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, some will tell you, even our own community, 
They would tell you that in order for you to be saved, you've got to be baptized. And they use this verse here. But that verse is taken out of context for the rest of the thing that was being said prior to it. That the foes of God, the foes of Christ were killed in the flood. And so you can't look at the water as that which is saving. The water never saved. Our salvation is always linked to what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that brings us our salvation. And so baptism is only a sign, it's only a symbol, a picture of a greater thing that Christ has done in our hearts as we go down into the judgment of the water, we find that Christ is the one that saved us. And what saved the people, by the way? Was it the water? No, it was the ark. It was the ark that saved them. And it's not the water that saves us, it's the ark of Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what saves us as well. And so we find that Christ is victorious over foes. His foes look like they're winning, but Christ was victorious. But one more I want you to see. Christ is victorious and reigns as supreme. Notice what it says in verse 22. Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into the heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been made subjected to him. The word subject is a military term That means he outranks them all. Christ outranks everything in this world. And the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians that one day that every knee will bow. Whether you bow your knee in this life, you will bow your knee one day. And you will acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He reigns supreme now. Christ reigns supreme, and he rules supremely now as Lord. Imagine these believers as they're reading this letter and hearing it read, suffering and facing persecution. They understand that through their suffering, they too will be victorious. They will be victorious because as Christ won, they win. As Christ won, we win today. One of the greatest battles to ever be fought was the battle at Waterloo. It occurred in Belgium. It was against Napoleon. It was fighting against the Western forces of Germany and also Great Britain. And after the war, as Napoleon was defeated, it said for a time that Europe had unprecedented peace and prosperity for a long time. But one author writes about a significant point that happens after the battle of Waterloo. After the battle, they sent ships across the English Channel to the shores of England to let them know that that Napoleon has been defeated and to let them know that they have won the battle and Wellington had won. And they did it by uh, various flags that were flown to, to give signals, and they were signaling it all the way back to London. As the signal came to London at Windsor uh, Cathedral in London, they began to fly the flags atop for everyone could see what happened. But as they were flying the flags, a dense fog and a mist moved in. And here's what it said. Wellington defeated. That's all they saw. Wellington was defeated. Well, the word went out across London. The people were so despondent, afraid of what was going to happen next hearing that Napoleon won that decisive battle at Waterloo. But in time, the fog began to clear. And the rest of the message was seen on the flags that said this, Wellington defeated Napoleon. For some of you here today, the fog has set in. The fog of discouragement has set into your life. 
pain and suffering has obscured the message of the victory of Christ. And you've taken your eyes off because the suffering is so real and the pain is so great. But you need to hear the rest of the message today is that Christ is victorious. He was victorious over sin. He was victorious over death. He's victorious over his foes. And today he reigns victorious, supreme King of kings and Lord of lords. Sometimes it's hard in the midst of the fog and the discouragement and the suffering. You read the message and it just says defeated. But what Christ wants to do today is to blow that mist away out of your life and want you to see the rest of the message is this, is that we win. It's that we win because Christ won. And because Christ won and reigns victorious, it means that we too in him will reign victorious. And so today... Allow the fog to pass over. Allow the mist to fall. And hear the message of the Lord is that Christ is your victory. Christ has won. Father, we thank you that you have won. And we know in our pain and our suffering at times we lose the full message But Father, we pray today that your message would be made so clear today to those that are here that are suffering and in pain, discouraged and broken in their lives, that they would hear the whole message is that Jesus has defeated Satan and that he's won the mighty victory for us over sin, over death, over our foes, And he reigns supreme as Lord of lords and King of kings. And so, Father, I pray that today that you would touch those that are hurting. That you would encourage them today in the midst of the fog that they're in. That have obscured the hope that we have in Christ. That you would bring a new steadfastness to their life. a new hope to them, a new strength to their lives. Christ has defeated the foe. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.